Okay, folks, uh, thanks again for tuning in. I just thought it would be better that we get started really straight away rather than let the, the week linger on before achieving anything. So my name is Dermot O'Connor. I'm the person that emailed you this morning. And uh, I'll be presenting this module with Frank Walsh. Essentially, I'll take the first half and Frank takes the latter half. So really, usual story at this lecture, I'm just going to give you an overview of the entire topic. Uh, we're not going to cover any detail, really. We'll leave that going to Wednesday. Now, just on the timetable, I think it says that I lecture you on Monday and Frank lectures you on Wednesday afternoon. That's that's not how it's going to work. Uh, as I said there a moment ago, I'll take all of the lectures for the first half of the semester and Frank will take all of them for the second half. So. I will have you at uh, 4.15 on Wednesday. And again, that will be online as well. All of my lectures will be online. I'd say Frank will probably be online as well, although he's a little bit more open to the face-to-face -face, uh, than I can. So you can discuss that with Frank maybe when it comes to it. But it seemed to work fine last year. We, we did all of the lectures online and all of the labs in person. So as is typical with online lectures, I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, we'll kind of pick up the story from there. I suppose before I start, I should invite any initial questions from you just in case there are any teething issues with either me speaking, I presume you can hear me. Is that right? Yep. Okay, good. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get going. I don't see us being here for the full hour now, but that's okay. Can you also confirm that you can see my screen now? Yeah, we can. Yep. Great. So you've probably come across this this uh, layout before, uh, rather than Moodle as a way of presenting modules. Uh, I'd imagine we needed certainly web app development one. He saw this kind of uh, as we call it in house as a tutor's website presentation. Uh, so there are two cards here. Uh, so this is what I'm going to cover today. Just the overview if you do need to go into it you don't really need to you can i'll put the slides up on uh on the on my screen and you can follow that way but if you just prefer to click through the slides yourselves you can just go click onto this card here and the slides that i'm going to talk my way through are these ones here and really on on wednesday i guess we will try and start into the very first topic which is javascript i'm going to give a crash course on JavaScript. I will try and achieve it over two lectures, hopefully, because I'm pretty sure you've all done some JavaScript before. You've certainly done, done it in Web App Development 1, and you may have done some JavaScript development privately as well. So that will be fairly quick. We'll, it'll be a review, really, rather than covering the language from, from the outset. And then as we work our way through this uh, module, more of these cards, as we call them, will be added uh, as we progress. So today, I just want to, as I said, give an overview. Uh, also, just before I move on to that, I will, or you will be invited to a Slack uh, channel we will use Slack for any kind of uh, communication, I guess, outside of class and labs. So you will, you will, you will receive a, an invitation in the next couple of days to join the Slack channel. And we'll probably use Slack even within the labs as well. Now, um, this is kind of the one-liner in terms of what our objective is, uh, but we need to drill behind it a little bit. So the first thing we can tell from this, uh, clearly this module is all about web apps, but when I talk about design and development, 
clearly this indicates that the module is going to be very practical based, which it is. So there'll be, you know, a lot of code coming at you and all the labs will be about developing uh, code. Now, what's a bit vague and intentionally so is the word modern there. Uh, doesn't really give any clear indication as to what we mean by modern. So really I want to drill behind that a little bit and expand on what I mean by that. Secure is, that's a fairly understandable term, especially in the context of what we learned yesterday about the air linkage situation. Whether that was a security breach or not, I'm not too sure, but uh, we'll do a little bit on security. Uh, not a lot though, but uh, we will make our apps uh, uh, honor some basic security principles. But it's really all about going to be about development, design and development of web apps and modern web apps, whatever that means. So I'm going to give you the context for the web app space. And once we have that context, then by context, I mean, where did web apps kind of emerge from? And once we have an understanding of that, then we can talk more specifically about what we plan to do in this module. And the last thing I'll talk about is just some software that you need to install. But as I thought about it before the lecture, you probably have a lot of the software already installed from Web App Development 1. Can you remind me when you studied Web App Development 1? Was it in the first semester of second year? Can you remember? Anybody? I think it was first or second semester, but I'm not sure. Uh, the, the second semester of, of first year? Yes. Was it that early? Okay. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Um, it was earlier than I thought. That's fine. So that, that's that's a lifetime away, I guess, in, in, in one sense. But uh, you know, I'll conjure up some memories of that module uh, for you in, in this talk here, hopefully. Um, that means really that the JavaScript stuff is going to be really important for you because uh, in the, my, my review of the JavaScript module is going to be really important for you in this module because it's really foundational. If you don't have, if you're not comfortable with JavaScript, uh, you're going to you're going to have a lot of difficulty going through this module. And if 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 you are right in saying that it was in the first year, way back in first year when you did web app development one, then Perhaps the JavaScript is a little bit hazy in your memory, and that's fine. Okay, um, right, context. So what I'm showing you in this diagram here is what I'm calling the architecture of this modern web app idea. So on the left, I have a browser, obviously, because if it's anything web-based, we need a browser. In the middle, I've got two servers, uh, playing a role. And then on the extreme right, I have a file system on the top and I've got a, some sort of database uh, at the bottom. Now, the way it kind of works is when you enter the URL of a web app into your browser, the browser communicates with the top server. Let me just get my pen here. Um, the browser communicates with this server up here. This is just an ordinary HTTP server. Nothing fancy, just a bog standard uh, web server, like you would get for serving a static website. And what the server will do, having received the request on the particular URL from the browser is, it will grab the necessary assets associated with the web app. The assets will comprise of very little HTML. In fact, all the HTML will be is an empty HTML page, but it will be a HTML uh, .html file. Uh, it'll also grab JavaScript, uh, and there will be a lot of JavaScript, although it will be bundled into one asset file, but the volume-wise, there will be a lot of JavaScript code, and any, any CSS files. And it sends all of those assets back down to the browser. And what the browser does is it executes the JavaScript immediately doesn't display anything on the screen. Uh, well, it displays a blank screen, uh, a blank screen, I suppose, but other than that, it then executes the JavaScript and it's the JavaScript code that executes in the browser 
that's what dictates what is actually displayed as the home page for this web app. So the JavaScript actually uh, renders, as we say, what the user sees, and it, it does that within the browser. It computes that, if you like, within the browser. So now we have the home page of the web app displaying on the browser, and the user interacts with us by clicking a navigation link or whatever. Now, let's say they click on some hyperlink within that home page. That will cause my JavaScript code to respond to that, and it will change or modify what is displayed on the screen as a result. It will also change the URL address in the browser. But it doesn't necessarily, even though it changes the URL address in the browser, it doesn't necessarily communicate with any server. Uh, which is an unusual thing uh, if you're coming from this kind of static website world. Uh, what it may do, though, uh, is uh, it may actually talk to this server down here, but the only purpose of communicating with this server is to ask it for some data. The data will probably come from the database. There may be, the, be a bit of computation of that data as well down here, and the data will then be sent back to the browser. And the JavaScript code in the browser will now essentially kind of stitch that data into what the user sees on the screen. Again, it's JavaScript code that is going to take care of that kind of stitching operation. So sometimes when the user clicks a hyperlink in the on the screen, sometimes the browser will communicate down this way. It will never communicate up this way. It may communicate down this way to get some data, or it may not. It may not need any data, any new data, uh, but it will always execute some JavaScript code as a result of the user clicking a hyperlink, and that JavaScript code will always change some of what the user sees on the screen. Hence, the browser is dynamically generating what the user sees on the screen. And it's that JavaScript code that we will spend the first half of this module uh, developing. The, the server down here, we refer to it as a web API server. And that means really that it, all it's concerned with is receiving requests for data and returning that data back. Typically, it returns the data back in a format known as JSON. It doesn't have to be, though. It could be XML or, or YAML or something like that. In our case, it would be always JSON. So that's kind of uh, a, the architecture of what I'm classifying as modern web apps. And I've also tried to explain, essentially, the flow of execution uh, for these web apps, which we'll get used to as we, as we work our way through this module. This is explaining the flow of execution, uh, again, just using a UML um, sequence certain, I think they're called. So again, I, I don't want to overdo it now. But, uh, so initially, my browser here is on the left. Here are my two servers. This is the server that was on the top of the previous screen. This is the server that was at the bottom of the previous screen. So initially, the browser communicates with the web the, the HTTP web server, it returns the assets associated with the web app. And again, that would comprise of an empty HTML page, a lot of JavaScript code, albeit in one single file, and maybe a couple of CSS files as well. Browser then, as I said, uses the JavaScript to generate what is displayed on the screen. And then any subsequent interaction the user has uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean always have to be clicking hyperlinks, could be selecting drop down menus, uh, checking tick boxes, clicking buttons. Uh, all of those types of interactions may trigger uh, a communication, uh, a HTTP get request to this web API server for the purpose of getting data. They may also, it may also result in a post request, HTTP post request. I'm hoping now you can remember HTTP get and post from your networking uh, that you studied along the way. So that really uh, explains again how the flow of execution works between my browser and my servers uh, in this 
postmodern web app uh, architecture. Uh, so in terms of kind of uh, the subsystems or the roles of the subsystems, as I'm calling it here, the, the browser in this architecture, the browser is responsible for rendering. Rendering means it actually generates what the user sees on the screen, uh, which in our case would be kind of, it generates the HTML, if you like. And it also is responsible for handling navigation. So it changes the URL address in the browser in sync with the fact that the user has maybe clicked on a link to display a new page, let's say. So it takes care of both of those. The web API server, which was the server at the bottom of my earlier screen, that is concerned with implementing what I'm calling business logic, which might be you know algorithms or any type of computation. Uh, data processing, that kind of stuff, and as well, communicating with my database. By the way, these web API servers here, these are the exact same uh, web APIs that are used by native apps on your mobile phone. So for example, if you use, a, if you have a Spotify app on your phone, you can imagine down here, and I've got my mobile phone representation here, You've got an app running on that phone, the Spotify app, let's say, and it will be communicating with the Spotify web API. Similarly, if you've got a YouTube app on your phone, it's going to be communicating with a YouTube web API. So all of the apps that you have on your phone, there may or may not be an equivalent, all of the native apps that you have on your phone, there may or may not be an equivalent web app for that particular um, um, uh, user kind of utility. There may or may not be, which is why we can access YouTube, for example, from within a browser, or we can access YouTube from, with, from within a native app on our uh, mobile phones. But the point I'm trying to make is they're both using the same web API server. So that's the modern. Uh, the alternative then is what I'm just classifying as traditional. These are very non-technical terms now. I'll give you the technical terms distinguishing these two. The traditional web app, the traditional web app is what you would have developed in web app development one, if you can recall back to that module. And in that, in, in these traditional web apps, essentially, the server, there, there is typically only one server uh, and it takes care of everything. It takes care of generating all of the web pages that make up your web app. And the browser we often refer to is a dumb client. It really hasn't any functionality uh, executing within it, which is very different from what I was explaining earlier on. So for these traditional web apps, there's still lots of them out there. Initially, when the, the user enters the URL of the web app, the browser will communicate with the web server with the web app server. That will grab the assets, some of the assets from here, which would be HTML, um, maybe some CSS, and and maybe some either JavaScript or JavaScript code, or it could be PHP. It depends what what it's written in. And it will actually generate the full home page, if you like, and send that page, which is going to be HTML and maybe some CSS back to the browser and the browser just displays it. Now, every time the user interacts with this page by either clicking a hyperlink, let's suppose they click a hyperlink, immediately the browser is going to send the request back to the same server, essentially asking the server, you generate the new page that you want me to display to the user. So it's this server again that is responsible for computing the new web page uh, by either grabbing some data from the database uh, or maybe some extra assets up here. Either way, it'll generate the entire new web page, 
even though that web page may have a lot in common with the previous page. It'll send a completely new HTML page and maybe some CSS and the browser will just display it again. And that interaction keeps on going. Sometimes, you know, as well, maybe the HTML will contain some data that it has retrieved from the database, but it is this server here that is responsible for doing that stitching operation that I talked about earlier on. So a lot more work on the part of the server in this case, and it's it's not a web API server. We tend to refer to it as a web app server. And again, this is the type of apps that you are developing in web app development one. So you might like to just dig that out, dig out some of the apps or app that you developed back then, just to remind yourselves of how they actually kind of worked from a runtime behavior. Um, and in terms of the roles of the browser and the server in this traditional web app model, like note here, my, my browser box, my orange box is empty. And I'm, by that, I'm trying to get across the message that it really has no functionality at all executing within it. It just simply receives full HTML pages from the server. And note here, rendering is now part of what the server does whereas we had rendering over here before. Uh, so it, it, uh, it lets the server do everything. Now, even though I'm classifying these as traditional web apps, it turns out this model is becoming very popular again. So it's by no means old fashioned in that sense. In fact, there is a, an almost a, a shift away from the other model, what I, what I was calling the modern one, back to this one or certainly they are competing with one another. Sometimes this model is actually a better model than uh, what I was previously describing. Even though I'm using the terms modern and traditional here, that's slightly misleading. Uh, this is the communication flow. I'm not gonna talk through this uh, for the traditional model. So our focus is on the modern web app uh, architecture. And that model, you know, it has gone through a number of evolutions. The first evolution was way back in 2004. So, you know, to, to call it, uh, a web app that dates back that far, to call that modern now is, is again a bit misleading, but I'm just using these terms just for the sake of simplification. So the very early versions of these, um, I just keep on using the term modern, uh, of these modern web apps do date back to that far, back to 2004. Uh, Gmail originally was a, a modern web app. It had that uh, architecture as well as YouTube. But way back then, there was a lot of issues with developing these types of uh, apps. And the, the, the kind of problems were you had to write an awful lot of JavaScript code uh, and there was no real best practice in terms of how you should structure that code. So it tended to be, you know, very difficult to maintain it, it tended to be spaghetti-like in, in, in structure. So the whole developer experience was very unsatisfactory. It was kind of the, I'd say it was the early days in this model. So lots of disadvantages with it from a developer experience point of view, in terms of code maintainability, code structure. Also, you actually have to be conscious of, well, where is my JavaScript code going to be executing? What type of browser is it going to be executing in? And you may have to have your code find out what is the underlying browser and maybe modify what code should execute as a result. So again, these were headaches that the developer had to take into account. Also, the earlier version of these web apps, I'm saying they lacked addressability. Addressability, if you just think of a website for, the mo for a moment, just an ordinary static website, and we know when we click on a hyperlink on a website, 
the browser's URL address bar changes and what we see on the screen changes. So every time you click a hyperlink, you get that uh, change in the browser's URL address bar and a change in what the user sees. So they, what we say is that the URL address bar in the browser and the page that is being displayed are always in sync. And this, that's one of the fundamental kind of principles of how the web uh, is meant to work. However, these early uh, modern web apps, they actually lacked that characteristic. So what you found yourself uh, experiencing was you might click on a hyperlink in your Gmail, let's say, client, uh, and maybe you click down a hyperlink for a particular uh, entry in your inbox, and it displayed the email message in your inbox, but the browser's URL address never changed as you navigated around the place. Okay, so there was no synchronization going on between what was being displayed on the screen and the URL address in the browser. So that's what I mean by addressability. And of course, what's the, what's the whole point of addressability in general in the web? Well, the whole point is if I want to inform you of a particular web page buried within a website, I don't have to tell you to go to the home page of the website and then explain to you how to navigate to the particular web page. I can just give you the URL address of that web page within the website and you go straight into it. That was the kind of neat feature of addressability. Well, you didn't have that characteristic in the very first generation of these modern web apps. However, I, I guess one of the big uh, downsides of them was the whole developer experience, the amount of code you had to write and there was no real best practice in terms of structuring it. Along came a library called jQuery, which you may have heard of and may have used. I'm saying jQuery there. Do I put a date on it? I don't. Oh, yeah, 2006. And the jQuery library was uh, addressing this is these issues up here. They, uh, they helped us, at least anyway, to improve the structure of our code. They also made our JavaScript code uh, cross browser compatible. So it didn't matter. It took care of essentially working out which browser you, you were working on. Remember now I'm talking about JavaScript code that's running in the browser. So the jQuery library was a, a brilliant introduction really uh, in terms of improving the developer experience. But we still had this uh, addressability issue, uh, which wasn't solved. And the next evolution is around the 2010 mark when we uh, had what are called single page app frameworks came into the picture, just another technology. And the single page app frameworks, they did solve the addressability problem. They also forced structure on our code. So all of the downsides that I've been talking about earlier on, they were all to a greater degree are not solved by these single page app frameworks. And that's where we still are now in this modern web app space, the use of single page apps. And we will be using a single page app framework for the first half of this module. So that's kind of how they evolved over time, essentially three evolutions of these modern web apps. That's my context. So what is this module within that context? Where is it going to uh, place itself? Well, it's obviously going to place itself in the modern web app world, as opposed to the traditional web app world. And it's going to leverage these single page app frameworks. We're not going to be using jQuery. jQuery now is gone out of favor, it has to be said, even though when it uh, came on the scene, uh, it was extremely popular, uh, but it has fallen out of favor a lot in more recent years. And the single page app frameworks have taken over. So back to our diagram from earlier on. Uh, so what we will be doing is we will be, first of all, focusing in the first half, we'll be focusing on this part of your modern web app architecture. In other words, we'll be developing a client that will run in the browser. 
and we will be using a single page app framework or technology called React, which is by far and away the most popular of these single page app frameworks. But there are a lot of them out there. Uh, and for an, a period, they're back around 2014, 15, 16, there were new single page app frameworks um, coming on stream almost you know, two, every two or three months. So it was a very competitive space. But React, which was released in 2013, I think, it has held its own really, uh, and it has dominated the market. But that won't go on forever. I'm sure that will change as well in the future. But for now, it certainly is the dominant technology. So we'll be looking at this React framework, uh, getting familiar with it. On the other side, on the web API side, uh, well, sorry, what, what is React? Very simply, it's a JavaScript library for uh, developing user interfaces, dynamic user interfaces. That doesn't tell us a whole lot, but it's enough for now. And then on the other side, on the web API side, we're going to be using a technology stack comprised of Node and Express. Now, you have used Node before. You were using it in Web App Development 1. In fact, I think you, you may have been using Express as well. Uh, can can you remember? Did you use Express before? I know you've definitely used Node. Anybody remember whether you used the Express framework? No, I'm hoping you're still there. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll plow on. Uh, so yeah, anyway, people are I saying they don't think so, and I don't think so either. All right. Okay. Uh, can any can you remember? what you use, I wonder, for developing your traditional web apps. I'm not following the chat now. Is there, if there's chat going on in the Zoom, I'm not actually following. Yeah, there it. is. It's a, uh, we were using Node.js, according to Adam. Okay. Uh, were you using Jade, I wonder? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, all the better if you have used Express with them. It'll be something new for you. From a database point of view, we could have really picked any database, but we will be looking at one called MongoDB, which I think is a database that you will be looking at in another module that some of you have as well called the NoSQL module. Uh, so that's good. You'll, you'll double up on that. But uh, NoSQL is not significant from this module's point of view. The significant parts are React and Node and Express. Uh, this is just another way of visualizing what this module is all about. Uh, and now my browser, again, my browser is on the left, my server is in the middle, and my database is on the right. And my browser is, uh, is the client. And so what technologies are we going to be using in the browser? We're going to be using React, HTML, and CSS. Uh, on the server, as I've just said, we're going to be using Express and Node. And on the database side, we're going to be using MongoDB. You could kind of think of MongoDB as a JavaScript-oriented database. And the reason I'm saying that is that really means that from end to end, from this end right over to this end, it's, it's JavaScript all the way. That's what we've decided to use. Now, we have no choice in the browser. It has to be JavaScript based in the browser, although we do have... Uh, WebAssembly now, which allows us to use other languages, but uh, traditionally, anyway, it's only JavaScript you can use here. But on the server side, we didn't have to use JavaScript. We could have used any language, like maybe Python or PHP or, God forbid, even Java. Um, but we we've decided to use JavaScript a because it's uh, Node is extremely uh, popular out in the industry, and it also makes life a little bit easier for you that you, you only need to. Uh, tackle one language for this module rather than having to tackle two languages. Uh, so we have this acronym, the MERN stack for Mongo, Express, React, Node. Uh, so you, you could say that we are going to be using the MERN stack for implementing our modern web apps in this module. That's the focus. Uh, so we'll be using a single page app and we'll be using uh, We'll be developing web API as well. Finally, 
in terms of software installation. Number one, you're going to need to install Node, and I'm uh, I'm pretty sure you have Node already installed. How do I find out? Well, it's the usual story. Uh, you bring up a terminal. Let's see, can I bring up a terminal here? I'm sure you know this already, but and from your whether you're a Windows person or a Mac person now, it's your dash shell or your command shell. And you just type node minus V, uh, or is it minus version? Minus, minus. Type that in to your dash shell. And I'm not too fussed about what version of node you have. It doesn't have to be uh, the latest and greatest. So anything that's uh, relevant within the last couple of years should be fine. If you, if this command throws back an uh, um, unrecognized command tree, as a node is an unrecognized command, then you've got to go to the node website, and that's what the screenshot is showing you here. And make sure that you install this one here. I, I took this screenshot a couple of days ago, so you, you're going to be installing version 16. That's something. Do not, do not, do not install this one here uh, because that is experimental. And I think the installation is pretty uh, foolproof, really. It's just to download and uh, run the installer, and it takes care of everything for you. But once you have installed it, then go back to your terminal, as I did there, and check that the node minus, minus version does come back with something sensible. Otherwise, you're going to have to check as to why the installation didn't add the node runtime to your path environment variable. So hopefully that should be straightforward enough. Number two, um, I am going to be using a an editor called VS Code. I would suggest that it would be good for you to also become familiar with us. Uh, you've probably used different editors. You certainly would have used something different when you were learning Java, um, IntelliJ probably. But VS Code has become extremely popular, really. And it's nice and lightweight, although you can add extensions to it. So again, if you don't have VS Code installed, go to this website that I'm showing you and just click the download button. And it, it's uh, it, it, the installation is just a simple executable. Uh, so it's uh, again, it's very seamless. And once you've installed VS Code, you started it up in whatever way you do, depending on what platform you have. So in my case, I can just go VS. So you will see something like this. I didn't want to do that. Now let's, uh, let's close that off actually. I'm going to start it again. So start up your VS code. And, oh, why is it doing that? Sorry. Going to do the exact same now again. Won't do what I wanted to do. Yeah. Okay. So if you're installing VS Code for the first time, the very first time you started, this is what you've presented with. And if you want to import, let's say, a small project into it, then it's a simple drag and drop. So maybe this is a project that I'm working on. Just drag and drop it onto VS Code, and away you go. So the layout of VS Code, again, if you're not familiar with it, is on the right, as in here. That's your editor area. This is clearly your file explorer area. What's nice about VS Code is that you can open up what's referred to as an integrated terminal within VS Code. So you don't have to, every time you want to execute something from the command line, you don't have to switch out of VS Code into uh, your Dash shell or your Mac. 
terminal. You can actually start up a terminal within VS Code. So the long-winded way of doing it is is why don't I see the terminal there? I'm going to do the shorthand if uh, it just allow me. You can see that at the bottom here. Now I use the keyboard shortcut. It should be it should be showing me terminal here. Just give me one second. This. Okay, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to spend time on it. Uh, I'm just going to. There should be a terminal option up here. Not sure why it's not popping up, but it doesn't matter. You can see that it's not even kicking off the terminal for me. It's a bit of a bummer. Let's see now, why doesn't it like that? Right, you can see it now here. Uh, I don't know why it behaved that way. Uh, so if you want to open up a terminal within your VS Code, this is how you do it. But you can see there's a, a keyboard shortcut, which I really use all the time. And here's my terminal down here, bottom. So I can type my normal commands that you would ordinarily type uh, from your DOS shell like whatever node minus v or et cetera, et cetera. So you, you never really need to leave VS Code when you're in the middle of development. That's kind of the nice, uh, that's the idea of this integrated terminal. And you, you get familiar with that from the labs. On the, on the extreme left side here of VS Code, this is what it calls its activity, uh, activity bar. Now, the, the main activity you'll always be doing is, is kind of exploring. So it'll be this one here on the top that will be selected. But the other one that you may be using initially as well is this one here. If you want to install an extension or a plugin for VS Code, and there are tons of them, and I do get you to install one plugin in one of the earlier labs, but the way you install a plugin is you click on this icon here called the extensions icon. Now in the background, what VS Code is doing is it's communicating with a remote repository that hosts all of the uh, legitimate extensions or plugins associated with VS Code. And as you type up here in the text box, it will search that repository for whatever you're looking for. Now, for example, I will get you to install an extension called the live server. So if I start typing here, you can see it's it's kind of filtering the list. Now, I've already installed live server, which is here. But if you hadn't installed it, it would appear down here in this list down here. And you simply click the uh, install button beside whatever extension you want to install and it takes care of the rest. On some time, some occasions when you install an extension, you do have to kind of restart VS Code, but on most instances, you don't. Uh, so that's where you go to install an extension. Uh, you'll only be installing one or two for me at most. So the majority of your time will be spent in the um, kind of explorer mode, as it's called, when you're just doing your development. Uh, and as well, you'll be using this integrated terminal a lot as well. Anyway, you'll get uh, 
that was by no means now a demonstration of VS Code. I'm just uh, playing with it for a few minutes. Back to my slides. VS Code, third thing that you will need, uh, again, this may also be already installed on your machine, is the tool called Git. Uh, it's likely that you have used Git a little bit in earlier modules. I'm not assuming it. We're only going to be using it uh, in very basic um, commands. And I will give you every Git command that I require you to execute. But you will be using it a lot. Uh, but I will I will always tell you what to do. Um, and again, you to check to see uh, if you've got Git already installed, you just open up your terminal and you do Git minus version. Now I'm sure I've got a pretty old version of Git, and uh, we're not. Uh, it's not really important what version of Git that you have, once you've got any version of it, that would be sufficient. So you can check for Git on your own personal laptop. Can I say as well that you will need to bring your own personal laptop to all of the labs. I'm not going to be using the desktops in the labs and I don't want you to use them either, even though even if it had the software installed, I would prefer that you use your own laptop for all of the labs. No, sorry. Okay, I'm nearly there in terms of time. I didn't expect to go for the full time slot, but um, so Git is number three, which you can check. Uh, everybody, if you haven't got a GitHub account already, then you must create a GitHub account for yourselves because you will be submitting your assignments uh, via GitHub. And the point that I'm making here is that make sure that your proper uh, name is appearing as your profile name. I don't care what username you use for your GitHub account, that's up to you. Uh, but your profile name must be your name as recorded on Moodle, if you like. And you can, if it isn't at the moment, then just use this edit button down here to um, to change it. Edit profile, you can see down there, will allow you to change it. I also, in one of the earlier labs, I get you to configure the Git tool that will be running on your local machine, you do need to do a little bit of configuration of that as well, but I'll explain what to do in the lab. GitHub is essentially, as you know, GitHub is like making backup copies of your source code that you have on your desktop. So we always like to see the summary page because that means it's near, we're nearly there. So the proper technical terms for traditional and modern are these terms here, server-side rendering versus client-side rendering. So we will be focused on developing server-side rendering web apps. In web app development one, you were concerned with uh, developing server-side rendering web apps. And as I said there at the beginning, they actually have come back into vogue again, albeit I suppose, second generation server-side rendering. So traditional and modern, uh, the service, okay at the beginning, but from now on, these are kind of the terms that you should be using as a technical person for distinguishing between the two architectures. And the CSR model, you know, it had, uh, went through a number of evolutions, which I tried to explain earlier on. So we need, don't need to go over that again. Uh, on the server side for this module, we won't be using a web app. We will be developing web APIs instead. And we'll be using something called the REST architecture for designing those web APIs, but that's a long way away. That's really the second half of this module. And in terms of a database, we're gonna use a NoSQL database. Specifically, we're gonna be using Mongo. We could have used a, rela a relational database just as well. They're still extremely popular. 
Right. Um, that's it. I will just give you an opportunity to ask any questions if you have before we close off this session. I should turn on my camera. No, no questions. Okay, so I will talk to you again on Wednesday. I didn't check to see when the labs are scheduled for. I'm not sure if there. I know there's one set of labs on Friday. I don't know when the other labs are. I think they're on Thursday, and I will attend those labs as well this week. On Wednesday, we'll start to look at JavaScript, and I will go through it fairly rapidly. Uh, so, and then the first two labs will be, um, if I just flick over to the website. Or if you think you're already fairly familiar with JavaScript, then what you could do is start looking at this lab here and work your way through it. You'll find it fairly straightforward, really. Um, if you're already anyway reasonably familiar with JavaScript. The second lab is a little bit trickier, uh, but we will cover what we need to in order to do the second lab in the lectures. And I've got two sets of slides. So hopefully I'll get through all of these on Wednesday and I'll get through these uh, the following Monday. Roughly, anyway, that's the, uh, that's the plan. I've just realized now that I've been talking about slides and you can't actually see what I've just been <laughs> talking my way through. Sorry about that. I didn't switch over to screen share. Apologies about that. Not to worry. I'll talk to you so on Wednesday afternoon. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.